Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. This Saturday bonus episode is a recording of an interview we gave on another podcast. Regular Words and Numbers episodes come out each Wednesday. Welcome to Room 101 at Harrigan Compound West. It's story time. So last time, I had some nightcap, Dunhill nightcap, and it was bottled in 2004. And the aging really helps. I can't even describe how much it helps. But of course, you can't just go get that anymore. And uh, these days, Dunhill has been taken over by Peterson, making the exact same blends in the exact same factories with the exact same recipe. So we do have an option there. And um, so those were my first two, right? The Dunhill early morning pipe and the nightcap. And after that, it took me a while, but I, I made my way to another four tobaccos. There were Balkan Sassiani, um, Hearth and Home Black House, White Knight, and Magnum Opus. And I, I started to refer to these as the essential six um, because no matter what I smoked, and there were always 40 or 50 tins open and bottled up, and, and I bottled them up over there. We'll show you that in a minute. Um, no matter how many I had bottled up, I still found my way back to these six probably three times as much as anything else, maybe even more. Over the years, two relatively new blends have come and joined the party, so it's now the essential eight. And I've got one of those new blends tonight, Drucker and Sons, um, Laragauri, which is a town in Scotland, obviously um, a Scottish blend, uh, as if I say that as if I knew what the hell that even meant. Um, I really don't. I, I take my, my cues from people who do this for a living. And uh, in this case, it's going to be a guy named Greg Peace who found his way to the Drucker and Sons uh, freestanding brick and mortar shop. Now, this was a company that had opened in London some years ago, 1841. And in 1928, for whatever the reason, they picked up stakes and brought it to uh, California, of all places, Berkeley. And Greg Peace, then a student at Berkeley, wandered in one day the way people do when they want to see what's going on in a store, and uh, ended up sticking around. And as a result of this, he he got a foot in the door of the tobacco business, which you might not think is a very big deal, but he never left, and he became one of the absolute greatest um, to tobacco blenders in the world. Every serious pipe smoker knows his work, um, and think about it, we all know his name which has to mean something, right? How many tobacco blenders do you think we would know in that way? Peace actually went on to form his own company, um, a very, very good one, GLPs, and you can get all kinds of just wonderful tobaccos from him. But we're, we're not dealing with his own company here. We're dealing with this Drucker & Sons re-release. Right? So he, he went back in his mind and he took all the evidence he could find in print and, and otherwise, and he tried to recreate seven of the Drucker and Sons blends from memory. And I have no idea whether he did a good job or not. I never had the originals. But I do know that the tobacco blends that he came up with for this line aren't just good. They're, they're out of this world good. He came up with seven. And, um, and I, I'm working my way through them. And I stop at Blair Gowry first because this tobacco has come to be my absolute favorite. And we'll see if it lasts in that top slot. I suspect it's going to for quite some time. Anyway, with um, with this new batch of Peace Tobaccos, it occurred to me because I really tore through the first tin. And I take a tin from, from there and bring it over to there. And now you see these places. Um, and I just dump the new tobacco into the jar over there. And, and I label it and whatnot. But it occurs to me that every tobacco is going to change over time, right? So that 2004 bottle of Dunhill Nightcap that I smoked last week, well, Nightcap right now probably doesn't taste exactly the same. It's probably a subtle difference. And so too everything else over there. And yet I bring it from one place, I pour it into the jar, put it in another place, and in my mind I refer to it as the same thing that I referred to, it, referred to as before I, I did the move. And I wonder if that can be right. I wonder if maybe there's not a theoretical problem in here somewhere. And, and it reminds me, God help me, it reminds me of um, 
the worst job, maybe the worst job I ever had, nah, probably second or third worst. Uh, I only held it for three days. I was very, very good at holding jobs for roughly three days. And this is one of them. And I was a waiter at a wretched place called the, the farm shop in Connecticut where I grew up. Um, the farm shop was later bought by Friendlies and they took it over and it became Friendlies. And that was really not much of a step up. It was just more of a lateral move. At the end of every shift, what we ended up doing was we took every ketchup bottle and we took the caps off and we lined them up and we would have to flop the one jar onto the other so its contents would leak into the lower jar. And, and now ketchup, uh, Heinz ketchup, was introduced in the American market in 1876, the centennial, the American centennial. And we were pretty sure that there were a couple of drops of 1876 ketchup in the bottom of every one of these bottles. It was absolutely revolting. I'm sure if the, if the health inspector came in, we all would have been in a, in a lot of trouble. But this kind of thing, this the tobacco, the ketchup, it leads to a very interesting question brought about in Greek philosophy of all things about the ship of Theseus. And, and Theseus, the, the figure, the character Theseus, was the mythical king and founder of Athens. And he sailed to Crete, where he and a bunch of his best friends um, killed the Minotaur and returned in safety. And the boat, the ship, was a 30-oar galley, uh, which was preserved by the Athenians for hundreds and hundreds of years thereafter. And what does that mean? How do you preserve an old boat? Well, they ended up taking all of the rotting wood off the boat and replacing it. And over the years came to be the case that every single piece of wood rotted and was taken away. So the question becomes this, is the ship still the same ship? Is this the ship of Theseus? Or does it cease to be that and become something else along the way? Don't answer so fast. Uh, Thomas Hobbes shows up and, and he's got something to say about this as well. So imagine this. I think this is actually a brilliant addition to the problem. What if every board of the ship that was taken out and replaced, what if the original boards that were all taken out because they were rotting, what if they cleaned up and they rebuilt the ship of Theseus from the old boards? Do you have two ships of Theseus? Do you have one ship? Do you have none? Which, which is the correct answer? And it gets into the very meaning of identity. How do you know a thing is a thing? What keeps a thing a thing? And I'm pretty sure nobody's going to have a really good answer to this, and it gets worse. Because are we all ships of Theseus? You, me, all of us. Our cells die and they're replaced, and we add thoughts and memories, and old ones seem to, to go. Do we even remain the same person over time? Am I the same person that James Harrigan was when he was 18? Now, the smart alecky answer to that is, well, God, I hope not. And, and yeah, that's right. But on a more meaningful level, I don't know what the answer is to that. I don't remember how 18-year-old James really thought about things. I remember bits and pieces. And the further we go back, the less I remember. And I, I suspect it's the same for everyone. And this is a weird place to end up because I moved tobacco from one place to another here in my office. So we're, we're dealing with Blair Gowry, and, and I said I don't really know what a, a Scottish mixture is, so why not have Greg Peace tell us? He's the guy who made the blend in the first place. And he says it's a blend similar to an English blend, which I guess makes sense due to proximity, with less Latakia, a more dominant Virginia character, and perhaps little or no oriental leaf. And how does that same Greg Peace describe Blair Gowry? He says it's a robust blend of matured and aged Virginia leaf, fine orientals, Cyprian, Latakia, and Perique. Perique is from uh, a parish down in New Orleans. So when he defines the entirety of the group, he says um, little to no orientals. When he describes this one, orientals take center stage. And they do. Uh, you taste them when you, when you light up. You really do. So here I am. Um, tasting the Blair Gowry, and it's amazing how different a blend can be. It starts with that familiar base, right? It starts with the English base, and yet it's not an English blend at all. And you get a handle on that. It's not a Balkan blend either. 
it's it's its own animal and I, i've never had other scottish buns there are only a few and i'm i'm thinking about trying them all but you know that's going to take a minute i got a lot of other things here that i really like really like smoking but this is a unique thing and and greg peace defines it in two different ways and fair enough i guess we don't have to be rigid in our classifications of things i know i've never been so maybe it's fine the way it is but i want to get back to this this business about maybe our all being ships of theseus ourselves and in order to answer this question I think we can um, consider the rock band Foreigner, of all things. So we're, we're going from the ancient Greeks to classic rock, I guess, would be the way to look at this. The original lineup for Foreigner, I'm, I'm sure nobody knows this, right? Everybody knows that Mick Jones, the guitar player, and Lou Graham, the singer, were in Foreigner at its iteration, at its original iteration. And yeah, we had those two. Believe it or not, we had Ian McDonald, a woodwind player, the hell is that all about? Um, a bassist named Ed Gagliardi and a keyboard guy, uh, Al Greenwood, and a drummer, Dennis Elliott. And then slowly but surely, that six-piece band turned into a four-piece. Okay, are they still foreigner? I guess so, even if they've lost one-third of the, the membership. Okay, what about when every original member shuffles out except Mick Jones. And Mick Jones gets himself a brand new lineup and he goes out on tour quite a lot, makes a fair bit of money at it. And the question I have, is that Foreigner? And what makes it Foreigner? Is it just a bunch of guys and Mick Jones who play Foreigner songs? Maybe. So I make this complicated by one more step. Mick Jones is getting older. He's talking about retiring. And he doesn't go on tour anymore, which means Foreigner tours as Foreigner without a single original member. Well, what the hell? Is that Foreigner or is that the best Foreigner tribute band there could ever be? Let me make it one step more ridiculous. Not too long ago, they had a a bit of a jamboree and 12 or 13 members of Foreigner reassembled and performed. Well, which the hell version of this is Foreigner? I'm not sure I know. I'm not sure there's a particularly good answer here. And it gives us a way, I think, to think about ourselves, our own identities. If I can't remember sufficiently what 18-year-old James was up to, are we the same person? And you would think that's that's frivolous in, in a way, and in a way it is. But it doesn't seem frivolous at all when we ask people who have been in prison for 20 years, if they have changed. I'm guessing they all have, some for the best, some for the worst. But there's maybe another way of looking at these sorts of things that will make more sense of how we think about this sort of thing. And it's called the perpetual stew. And and as you could probably imagine, this is gonna be every bit as disgusting as you might think. because we're, li- we're dealing here with a pot of stew that never stops cooking. It- it's kind of like a, a European church where they never actually finish the renovation to avoid that tax bill that comes when your building is no longer under construction. If you're wondering why there's always construction at European churches, there you go. Um, but the, this perpetual stew It's a pot of stew with all kinds of ingredients, and people serve the stew out of the pot, and then they don't let it cool. They just put more ingredients in. Day after day, week after week, year after year. The whole mess stays edible because it never comes below boiling. And and we can look at a restaurant in, in Bangkok, Thailand, for probably the most ridiculous version of this. The restaurant's called Watana Panic, And they have continued to maintain the same pot of broth from the same perpetual stew for over 46 years as of 2021. You want to go get some 46-year-old stew? I really don't. But here's the question. Is that stew that they're serving out of that pot the same stew that it was 46 years ago? And it occurs to me that maybe this is the better way of looking at things. We... 
things come and go, of course, but we all remain the same in some meaningful way, more or less, over the years. And we might not be recognizable to people that we only see every 30 years or so. But what about a person who sees us every day for those same 30 years? It's pretty clear that the changes inside of us are negligible day to day. But over 30 years, not negligible at all. All right, so this wasn't really a story. Sorry. I'll get back to a story next week. But this is interesting. Things aren't always what they seem, like a ship with no original parts. But sometimes they're the same, like a stew that never goes cold. And I'll leave it to you to figure out which of those two things is the way to understand yourself, because it's probably going to be one of the two. Tell me which one you come up with in the comments, I guess, and we could talk about it until next week when we'll do it all over again. Have a great week, and uh, maybe get yourself a pipe. A couple of people wrote to me, said they bought pipes because of last week, and I would encourage more of you to do that. I'm encouraging you to, you to smoke, because sometimes it's just better to indulge a little tiny vice from time to time. Have a good week. The the eight essential pipe tobaccos got me to thinking. Um, I must perceive the world in a very very routine way uh, in terms of essentiality because I remember I, I moved to Iraq and you can only take so many bags with you. In my case, two. So I jammed everything into those bags that I was going to need, and I had um, you know some work clothes, what have you. I also brought five short sleeve button shirts. And these I dubbed the five essential shirts. And uh, I, I wore them quite r r rigorously because what else are you going to do, right? It's 118 degrees there. Short sleeves seem to be exactly the right thing. And um, the first week I had to do my laundry. I did, I got everything in the machine and got it washed. And then I, I found out, I think I would have noticed this when I put them into the, the machine. I found out that there was no dryer. And as a matter of fact, Nobody in all of Iraq seemed to have a dryer. It wasn't part of the culture. So I, I later went down and bought a, a drying rack at the, at the grocery store. But before I did that, I would bring them into my bedroom. I would open the windows to get a little bit of a breeze in, and I would hang them on hangers and perch them all over the, all over the room. And I did that. I went to work, and I got back, and I went to collect my now dry shirts, and there were only four the five essential shirts, one of them got sucked out the window. And I actually saw a guy wearing it as he walked away. So I must have just missed. What can you do? So it turns out they, they weren't as essential as they thought. We could lose 20% of them and still be quite all right. So it goes.